The Helgeland class was the second class of German dreadnought battleships and comprised four ships, Helgeland, Oldenburg, Ostfriesland and Thuringen. Compared to the significantly flawed Nassau class covered previously, these ships represented a significant improvement. Although they retained the inefficient hexagonal layout and mixed secondary and tertiary batteries of the previous class, they had a larger main battery of 12-inch guns and improved engines, albeit these were still the triple expansion engines instead of steam turbines. But the German Navy was not the only major navy to hold on to this older technology longer than the Royal Navy. They were also longer than the Nassau's, with a greater displacement, which meant they were able to break 20 knots, and were a lot more stable, and could turn much better without losing speed. The ship's main battery consisted of 12 guns in six twin turrets, with an 8-gun broadside. Unlike the previous 11-inch guns of the Nassau class, these could actually be loaded at normal elevations, although their initial maximum elevation of 13.5 degrees gave them a short range, which was later corrected by later modification to allow a 16 degree elevation. Expanded magazines also meant they carried a useful, if somewhat small, load of shells. The ship's secondary armament consisted of 14 5.9-inch casement-mounted guns and 14 3.5-inch guns, also in casements. Although by 1917 these smaller guns had been removed and a light anti-aircraft battery fitted. Six torpedo tubes, laid out in roughly the same way as the turrets, completed the ship's armament. The 12-inch thick main armour belt compared favourably with contemporary designs, being thicker than most immediate rivals. The deck armour was fairly average at between 2.2 and 3.1 inches thick. The ships were laid down in late 1908 and early 1909, and were commissioned in 1911 and 1912. They would serve together as the first division of the first battle squadron in the high seas fleet, and took part in a number of actions. Firstly, they were part of the main battle force supporting the German battle cruisers in their raids on Scar Scarborough, Hartlepool and Whitby. Although at one point they were within 12 miles of the British second battle squadron, the Admiral in charge believed he was facing just the screening formation of the entire Grand Fleet, and so ordered a withdrawal. In fact, he was facing just six British battleships with the entire High Seas Fleet, a chance that was exactly what the Germans had been trying to engineer, and also one they would never get again. Another attempt to pull off the trick more successfully resulted in the Battle of Dogger Bank, but no engagement of Grand Fleet squadrons. In August 1915, the ships joined other German units in the Baltic for operations to try and force the Russians out. The four Helgolands were not committed to the actual battle, but were stationed outside the Gulf in order to prevent Russian reinforcements from entering the area. In 1916, the ships all took part in the Battle of Jutland, where they formed part of the centre of the battle line, ahead of the pre-dreadnoughts, but behind the more advanced German dreadnoughts. Their first action was against HMS Warspite, which was circling due to a jammed rudder, but due to a turn the fleet was executing, they could only fire on the ship for a few minutes before losing sight of it. For most of the battle, they avoided damage, but during the final emergency turn away from the Grand Fleet, Helgeland was struck by a 15-inch shell, which tore a 20-foot hole in the hull, allowing approximately 80 tonnes of water to enter the ship. At around midnight, the Helgoland and Nassau-class ships in the centre of the German line came into contact with the British 4th Destroyer Flotilla. The chaotic battle included the incident between Nassau and Spitfire covered in the Nassau video. Although the 4th Flotilla broke off the action temporarily to regroup, they unwittingly stumbled into the German dreadnoughts a second time an hour later. Oldenburg and Helgoland opened fire on the two leading British destroyers, but a British shell destroyed Oldberg's forward searchlights, fragments from the explosion also wounding the ship's captain and killing the second-in-command, along with a number of other men on the bridge, including the helmsman. Oldenburg was therefore temporarily without anybody to steer the ship, and was in danger of ramming either the ship to her rear or her front. Captain Hopfner, despite his injuries, took the helm and brought the ship back into line. Shortly after this, Thuringen and Nassau encountered the British armoured cruiser Black Prince. Thuringen opened fire and landed a total of 27 heavy calibre shells and 24 rounds from her secondary battery. Nassau and Ostfriesland joined in afterward, followed by Friedrich de Grosse, and after several minor detonations, the Black Prince disappeared in one massive explosion. 
Following the return to German waters, Helgoland and Thuringen, along with the Nassau, Posen and Westfalen, took up defensive positions for the night. Apart from the hit to Helgoland by a single 15-inch shell, Oldenburg had been hit by a shell from a secondary battery that killed 8 and wounded 14, and Ostfriesland and Thuringen escaped the battle unscathed, although on return to German waters, Ostfriesland struck a mine and had to be repaired. The ships saw no further significant action during the war and were ceded to the Allies under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. Helgoland was taken by the British and was scrapped in 1921, whilst Oldenburg was surrendered to the Japanese, who didn't actually take possession of the ship, instead they sold it to a British salvage firm that scrapped it in 1921. Thuringen was taken by France, where she was used as a target until she was beached in 1923. She was then broken up on the beach, but a large portion of the hull remains offshore. Ostfriesland is the most famous, being ceded to the US Navy, and later used as a stationary target during General Billy Mitchell's bombing display in 1921. The ship sank at 20 minutes to 1 in the afternoon after sustaining several bomb hits and near misses, and this was used to try and advocate for the use of air power over funding of more warships. However, the test was highly unfair and could even be called rigged. The ship would likely have avoided the hits it sustained had it been underway, and if it had been hit, damage control teams would likely have kept the ship afloat. Ultimately, all the test really proved was that if you left all the bulkheads open, shut down all the engines, and took away all the crew, you could eventually, over the course of a morning, bomb a ship into submission. In reality, it would take until the late 1930s for air power to represent a true, serious threat to an operational battleship. But when it did, the lessons of Ostfriesland came back to haunt many a navy. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.